Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining DP Solutions Fishing Awareness Webinar. Uh, my name is Jill Rose. I am your moderator and webinar organizer. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, everyone has been placed on mute just to cut down on any background noise. So if you do have any questions during the presentation, um, there's a box you can use to type them out. We will go ahead and answer questions at the end. Uh, if you'd prefer to ask your question rather than type it, just use the raise your hand button and I'll unmute you so you can ask your question directly. Uh, and off with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce today's presenter, Mr. Ben Schmerler. He is DP Solutions Senior IT Risk Advisor. Ben, take it away. Thanks very much, Jill, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, uh, if you were here about a year ago, uh, we did a, another webinar on phishing and um, we uh, decided, you know, this is a really good subject for us to revisit, update, talk about, because um, if I, you know, asking me, uh, this is the number one thing I get questions about. Uh, it's uh, the biggest threat that every organization is going to face, and it has really far-reaching consequences. So I feel like we should really revisit it and see where things are in 2018 and talk about it. So we're going to go through uh, some quick definitions. Uh, some samples, I'm going to show uh, show off some stuff, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. So first, just some quick definitions. So everybody knows what spam is. You know, it's just junk email, right? It may or may not be bad uh, in terms of malicious, but it's just junk. It's just like the junk mail you get at your home. Uh, but phishing is really distinct. So it's a type of spam specific to cyber attacks. So the goal, it, it, you know, the really distinguishing part of phishing uh, is the is the goal or the motivation is usually meant to perpetrate some kind of fraud or cyber attack uh, and it's either getting uh, personal information from you or infecting you with some kind of virus or malware perhaps to do something else after after the fact so I'm going to show a little bit of an example of a of a typical phishing scam in, in a few moments spear phishing is a little different you may have heard of this um, this is similar to regular phishing but it's focused and coordinated so it's usually a uh, much more organized and targeted attack on high-level individuals, executives of companies, managers, you know, people who have uh, levers of power who can uh, do a lot of things with their influence if, if tricked. Um, so social engineering is uh, the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information that may be used for fraudulent purposes. So we're going to see a lot about social engineering today because um, Really, uh, what's what's happening is the technology is is pretty good. It's not infallible, but what's more fallible than the technology is the user. And this kind of social engineering strategy is really used to take advantage uh, of the um, of the ignorance of many end users. So uh, phishing is a, a constantly spreading epidemic. And here's just uh, one example of, and this is from the Wall Street Journal of how, uh, how the bad guys do it. So this is kind of one example of a phishing scam. Obviously, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to align with every type of phishing scam, but this is just one way in which uh, maybe a cyber criminal might uh, exploit money. So first, uh, some kind of uh, seemingly innocent email is sent to small businesses and municipalities in the United States. Sounds very familiar, I'm sure, to most. That you probably see it every day. In this particular example, um, the emails contain uh, Zeus Trojan malware. So uh, that malware embeds itself into the victim's computers, basically just attaches itself to the operating system and uh, allows for things to happen that aren't in intentional uh, by the end user. In this particular case, uh, Zeus is a, uh, a keylogger. It records keystrokes. So essentially, rather than do something like, say, knock your computer out or slow you down or or give you ransomware or something like that where the machine is completely locked up or deletes your data, it's really just collecting information on you, right? It doesn't really care about the computer and what you're doing with it or, or stealing your data per se. It's really more about exploiting your personal information, account numbers, passwords, or personal data. But of course, once it has this, it goes into this other loop here. You can see we kind of have two loops. One is the actual cybercrime loop where the uh, technical attack happened with the emails and the malware and key loggers. And then the other side is, well, now we've got what we wanted, the, the ad that we wanted, which is the personal information. Now let's use it to, to make some money. So the cyber criminal uses the information to take over a bank account in some way. Maybe they logged into the website or, or whatever. Um, 
the cyber criminal transfers money to accounts set up with fake IDs by mules. So people in the U.S. on student visas or currently could be anybody who's really, uh, you know, being a criminal hiding hiding their identity. Uh, so as you might imagine, the mules make a commission. They basically are just running an exercise, much like, you know, you might pay a delivery man uh, for, for every delivery. <laughs> And then the rest goes to some cyber criminals. And, you know, for the most part, a lot of this is pretty much untraced and unfollowed. It's uh, once you get in out into the ether of, of the Internet and uh, an attack has happened, you know, these people are several steps ahead. Really, where you need to focus on on your uh, on what you're going to do about it is really the beginning here, because once all these events happen, there's really nothing you can do about these other events. You have to try and prevent it on the prevention side. You're not going to catch these guys after the fact, typically. Um, here is a list of top 10 general email subjects and percentages, kind of like uh, Family Feud, uh, survey says, where um, here are just some subjects uh, that we often see for phishing uh, emails. And uh, you'll see some, uh, some uh, things in common with these. So you see things like password check, required immediately. You have a new voicemail. Your order's on the way. Required. Uh, uh, you received a document for signature, a potential acceptable use violation. One big thing about this is that they all focus on urgency. All of them are trying to focus on something that you might care about. So your order is coming, better check on it. You know, everybody's ordering stuff from Amazon. You know, you probably have three or four things coming to your house this week. So it's a very attractive subject. Or if you need a password change, you know, everyone's a sense of the cybersecurity stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the hackers take advantage of that. I'm going to get into some of that a little bit later in terms of taking advantage of cybersecurity trends to, to work against you. But um, they use these things to try and get your own urgency on a cybersecurity uh, aspect. Uh, the vacation and sick time policy, I actually ran a phishing test uh, myself where I used that kind of subject. You know, we're changing the sick time and I caught a lot of people because that's a very sensitive subject. People don't want their vacations to be messed with. And so when I send an email saying, hey, I'm gonna mess with your vacation, all of a sudden people are clicking through. They forget about all their cybersecurity awareness and they decide, I, I really care about my vacation. You can see these are really very similar. And so when you're looking for phishing emails, look for this kind of stuff and be very skeptical when you see it. It's not to say that you couldn't get a legitimate email with these kinds of subjects, but it's uh, obviously uh, a way to take advantage of an end user. So uh, this is uh, the newest statistic we've come up with. I was trying to look for something for 2017, but I, I couldn't find it. Um, uh, the number of, of unique phishing attacks was over 1.2 million, and that was a 65% increase from 2015. Um, I'm not exactly sure how this is measured, but if you had to ask me, I would imagine in 2017 that this was probably more like 2 million or 3 million. I mean, it's, it's something that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and I see more and more and more of it. I see it in my own inbox more and more. Uh, because as you might imagine, you know, my email address is out there. I'm a target. People might think that they could take advantage of me to get uh, something from DPS or or just my maybe my personal information. So I see this all the time. 76% um, of organizations reported being the victim of a phishing attack in 2016. Maybe a uh, this seems to me almost like a low number. I, I wonder if it's more because um, I see it everywhere. This was in 2016, of course, so maybe it is higher now. Uh, more than 400 businesses are targeted by business email compromise scams every day, and that's according to Symantec. So basically, if you are a business, if you have something that you care about, you're a target. Uh, if you're an individual and you have private information, you have a bank account or a credit card, you're a target. Um, the thing about phishing is that it, ha it casts a wide net. It really doesn't care about who you are or where you are, how big your organization is, whether you're a for-profit, not-for-profit, a retired person, a, a student. It doesn't really care. So here's uh, one example uh, of a phishing attack, and this is a very common one. It's PayPal, and you can see uh, that this uses a lot of things that are, are uh, on, you know, typically seen as legitimate. It's using PayPal's logo. The colors here, I mean, I, I don't know um, if any on the call are regular PayPal users, but I mean, these are PayPal's colors. When they send you an email, they're using sort of this dark blue, light blue stuff. Um, and it's a really short kind of business formatted email. You can see we've got no intentions on the uh, on each paragraph. And uh, it's written pretty well, actually. You know, it's not, this isn't the phishing attack where 
you see it's got garbled English or something like that. It's actually written uh, fairly, uh, fairly well. But notice it says the response requires generating an urgency. The email address doesn't make any sense. It's service at in, intel.paypal.com or whatever this is, service.epipal at outlook.com. You know, obviously this is not legitimate. That's a big clue for a lot of these things, which we're going to get into in a minute. Um, it's uh, really pushing you to click something. Uh, and it's even using do not reply to this email and something, you know, things like that, things that you might see in typical messages. Um, the number one thing on this would be the, the uh, sending address that I would look out for. Um, what might happen uh, when you click through something like this, this isn't necessarily related to that previous example, but um, oftentimes they'll either use a fake attachment, so something that looks like it's an actual attachment, like a, a Word document or a PDF or something, or an actual uh, hyperlink, a URL, and you end up at some site. You know, this is one that would use maybe Google Drive as an example. Hey, get into your Google Drive so you can download this important thing for me or see what I dropped for you in your Google Drive. Or maybe it isn't even related to Google Drive. It's just that when you click the link or attachment, you end up here. And um, uh, the URL is blurred out here, but this is, as you may be able to tell, it's kind of small. Uh, this isn't even, this is uh, using, referring to an HTML file. This isn't Google site. This is just a, uh, embedded web page, uh, web uh, page that somebody created, and all it's going to do when when you input your email and password, it's going to send this information to a bad guy, so they can use it. It's not actually Google; they're just taking the graphics from Google and and taking advantage of you. So it's really important that you check out what's in that URL before you enter your uh, your sensitive credentials. Um, here's an example of spear phishing. This is one I've I've used quite a bit because it has a lot of um, a lot of good examples of things to look for in, in the case of a uh, phishing attack. So first, notice we've got, it's, uh, the email is from a, a, a guy, Doug Williams, but his email address is completely incomprehensible. It's this Chris PID at tonline.de. Uh, tonline uh, I think that's a German, if I'm not mistaken, a German domain. Um, but um, this doesn't make any sense. These things don't really align at all. If that wasn't enough, uh, it's really causing urgency to talk to the controller, right? Hey, we really want to talk to the person who has all who has access to money. Uh, again, uh, another clue here is this is a private message for the controller Lehigh University. In this example, this came from Lehigh's uh, site. Um, this is a private message for this person, which is kind of weird because if if this person here is the controller, why would it? You know, why would it have this sort of weird language where it would refer to it so impersonally? If it, it says if it's not you, the controller, please ignore, ignore and discard it. It doesn't want you to know if this, if you're not the person meant to receive this attack, it doesn't want you to let anybody know that you're, you're subject to a phishing uh, attack. They don't want to be blocked by a spam filter or get reported or anything like that. They just want it to be forgotten about if you're not the, the person it's referring to. This is where the spear phishing comes in. It refers to a specific name. Maybe it got it from LinkedIn or or uh, the or the uh, university's website or something like that. And it creates the urgency again by saying, since we have not received a contract termination letter, it's basically setting up the premise: Hey, you haven't terminated anything. You better do something right now. I'm assuming you might have uh, overlooked the invoice, and it refers to this weird invoice number, which also you can see here is highlighted in a different color for whatever reason and says unpaid to just generate that urgency again. Um, it also creates more urgency by saying that early withdrawal penalties will apply. Again, it's just pushing and pushing and pushing this user to respond. You've got this thing, you really need to take care of it. You gotta do it right now, otherwise there's gonna be penalties. You haven't sent the termination letter in. You, this is for the controller, this is intention, very, very important. Everything is about getting you to be scared and, and react to it in a way that you might not otherwise if you knew what was happening. Refer to the attached document for billing information. Um, you know, always be skeptical when there's an attachment. You know, in this case, let's say um, you knew Doug Williams. You know, you can make a phone call uh, and ver verify that the information down here is correct on on probably the Sterling Savings Bank website and verify that this is all true. Um, here's another example, and this is one I pulled uh, earlier this year, as as uh, many of 
the people on the call may realize, uh, GDPR was a big thing uh, early in the spring that started popping up. You know, the General Data uh, Protection Regulation, I think, is what it uh, stands for, and uh, it's a European Union rule. And a billion companies sent out uh, notifications: be ready for GDPR and do this for GDPR. And of course, uh, for the average person, especially in a small business. Uh, you might not really need know what you need for GDPR. So these are very attractive things to click on. It's got that urgency right away. But uh, the phishing uh, attackers are, are, are savvy in the sense that they're taking advantage of this. They know that you care about GDPR, so they're sending out phishing attacks themed with GDPR. Um, a similar thing happened with the Equifax hack. So when Equifax had their data breach, um, they obviously had the first uh, attack, which lost all that personal data, but then other cyber criminals decided to take advantage of the website and put ads that were that were phishing ads in the Equifax website because they knew people would end up on the Equifax website looking for uh, for relief from the uh, from the fraud to their personal information. And so they're taking advantage of that. They're trying to play a psychological game. And you can see here, it's asking, asking you, update your account because of GDPR for this Royal Bank Canada message. Review and update your information on this bank. And please update your PayPal account. You know, All this thing, because of GDPR, you have to do it. It's, it's doing the same things it's asked you in, in perhaps a phishing attack that I showed earlier, like the, the PayPal example, except it's now it's coach, uh, couching it in this uh, GDPR blanket where it's saying, hey, you got to do this because of GDPR. And that probably caught people. Uh, social media is another area in which we're seeing more and more phishing attacks. So this is on LinkedIn. In some ways, this is even more seditious because uh, LinkedIn is very much about trust and creating trusted networks. You know, network, networking with people you can do business with. You know, oftentimes, salesperson go here to, to generate new business. Or if you're looking for a partner, you go to your LinkedIn page first to try and find people you trust. And so this is a really tight knit thing. So when Wells, when supposedly Wells Fargo sends you this message on LinkedIn, maybe it's going to get your attention. And then of course you click on the link, and it brings you to this site where it says update your information, and you give them all the information they need to basically open up any kind of line of a line of credit against you. <laughs> they have uh, whatever your username and password. They can get into your account. They can have your social security number, credit card numbers. They can run your card or open up a new credit card, uh, your name, phone number, basically everything about you. <laughs> uh, I could do a lot of damage, or anybody could do a lot of damage with this uh, information. I, I, of course, wouldn't wouldn't do that sort of thing, but people could do a lot of damage, and it's using, again, a trusted source, LinkedIn, to try and, and uh, capture you. Notice uh, also, uh, this is the same example, but sent to a different person. Um, when you when you get LinkedIn emails, typically you'll get a copy of that email to your inbox. I think that's something you can either opt in for. It's part of the default. I'm not totally sure, but um, you know the same sort of thing. This is an email from your LinkedIn person, and it's got those buttons: reply not interested, using the LinkedIn theme uh, in terms of graphic. View, view Wells's LinkedIn profile, which is kind of weird because Wells Wells is LinkedIn profile. It's referring to Wells Fargo as an individual. You know, another one of those uh, those clues that. It teaches you that it's maybe not uh, there. If you click not interested, you know, obviously not interested is not going to bring you to a good web page. It's going to bring you a page to either collect more information on you or maybe infect you with a Trojan or something. You can see here in mail hit reply LinkedIn.com. So it's it's spoofing an email address. Uh, Wells Fargo is never going to contact you through LinkedIn to do any kind of account stuff. So you should immediately be skeptical of these sorts of things. Um, CEO fraud scams. So this is uh, a much more simple and uh, seditious kind of fraud scam. Um, it's just going to a CEO and being very direct, you know, spoofing some email from somebody they trust. And uh, and you can see uh, the original message is, uh, are you in the office? I can send the wire. Uh, yeah, I'm here. We can send the wire. Do you have the information? Cut off is 2:30. What's the status? You know, again, it's creating this sort of urgency, creating this trust that you do something uh, that you wouldn't otherwise uh, want to do. And you can see there's no special trick here. It's just, hey, I really need this payment, and you trust me, so send me the send me the money. Uh, if you're doing any kind of wires of any significance, this kind of 
lax verification with a couple emails is probably not sufficient. You need to set up the processes in your own organization where um, if uh, something like this happens, that you make a phone call or you create policies so that there is some kind of discipline to make sure that before we do something we might regret, that we've uh, 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 sort of checked off all the boxes and made sure that this is a legitimate request. This happens all the time. It's happened with uh, uh, clients of ours, and um, we saw it happen with a, uh, a very local uh, a personal group with some personal information where someone requested uh, names of a membership list, and they just sent it, including uh, Social Security numbers, credit card information. So this does happen quite a bit, and it tricks average people. Um, CEO fraud is uh, a scam in which cyber criminals spoof company email accounts and impersonate executives to try and fool an employee in accounting or HR into executing unauthorized wire transfers or sending out confidential tax information. So that previous thing was just an example where it's literally just exploiting a trust relationship you have with someone. Maybe they took over that person's email account. Maybe uh, they spoofed that person's email account. But essentially, they know that you have a relationship with this other person and they're gonna take advantage of that relationship to get something out of you. So here's how uh, something like this might work. So really, uh, the bad guys are trying to start before the initial email. So they're looking for things, things that are publicly available, like who your CEO is or what the email addresses are, et cetera. And they're just gonna basically do a lot of research so that they can get the information they need so that they can begin their thing. They're basically casing the house. Like a, uh, like a home robbery might happen. Well, this is where the doors are, this is where the alarm is, we found the code for the alarm, et cetera. The attack hasn't actually taken place yet. They're just making it, they're setting up all the, the steps so this is as successful as it could possibly be for them. So um, the spoofed emails are sent to high-risk employees. So these are all kind of uh, spear phishing examples. You know, again, the finance department, CFO, human resources, I need this, everything's ASAP, send this money, send the PDF copies of the W-2s or this time sensitive invoice. I'm not even available to respond. You know, obviously these kinds of things should be seen as very skeptical. Um, this one even says, I'm not available to respond. I can't respond to you, so you better just do it. Um, I would say if someone's not available to respond to verify uh, a payment or an invoice request or something like that, then I guess it's not that important enough to actually do the work. So. My feeling is if someone can't verify something, it's probably not worth doing. So the response is these targets receive the email and if, they're, if they fall for it, they're acting uh, quickly and they're not really using the skepticism we want. Well, you know, I better handle this. It's from the CEO. I'm gonna get in trouble, so I better do this. I'll send these right away. Uh, of course, uh, these people are all falling for it in, the, in this case. And then, of course, the damage happens. So these people usually, by the time when they respond, they don't even think, you know, they don't think at the time that they fell for it. You know, they just they just do it. Um, I ran a phishing test uh, last weekend where I sent a a offer for free NFL Sunday ticket if you click now and get this stuff. And one person fell for it, and they came to me kind of sheepishly saying, "Well, I can't believe I fell for it." Well, but it was this sort of excitement that they had. Whoa, free Sunday ticket, I can watch any of the football games, I better click, and they just disregarded things. And this was the same type of person who on previous attacks did not fall for it. But because I was so enticing to them with their free offer, they fell for it despite warning signs. So anyway, the damage uh, all happens after the fact, and these wire transfers and data breaches happen. These people usually only find out about the fact that they've been victimized from the victims. Uh, in the end. So oftentimes the people who were exploited find out because somebody else told them that they were exploited, which is a really uh, sad thing and kind of embarrassing. So obviously there's some real damage from this. So the money is gone. Uh, it's pretty much not recoverable. I hope you have good insurance. And even if you do, who knows if you'll get it back. People are fired. Lawsuits are filed. The reputation is damaged. There's all sorts of things. Um, the real better thing to do is to have an awareness program up front and, and create a good culture so that these things don't even happen in the first place. I mean, uh, we think a lot about uh, dealing and responding to cyber attacks, but we don't think often about, well, what could have happened to avoid that attack in the first place? And what could we do to, to save uh, ourselves before we have this damage? Even if we're able to mitigate damage, it's best for that damage to never occur in the first place. 
So um, if, if you're interested, we'll have copies of the slide deck available, but here's just a few social engineering red flags to look out for. And this is a pretty big list. So you're probably not gonna get it all right now, but um, we'll, you could get a copy of this, uh, just give you ideas. So obviously we wanna look at who it's from. So uh, is it someone you communicate with normally? Is it, uh, is it related to what your responsibilities are? Um, Suspicious domains, you know, Microsoft Dash support is not real. We want Microsoft.com. Um, you don't know the sender. You don't have a relationship with them. Weird hyperlinks, things like that. All things to look out for. Even the two can be a, a flag. So if you're CC'd on something with 50 million people that you don't know, or um, you don't personally know the person it's directly to, it's just some weird list, that can often be a warning sign. Uh, you want to look at the hyperlink. So uh, uh, you can see in this case, you know, sometimes when you hover over this and, and this says bankofamerica.com, if you might, you hover over it, even though it says bankofamerica.com, you hover over it and it says some weird gobbledygook character list, uh, that's not Bank of America. That's a sign of a potential phishing scheme. Um, uh, or the link is misspelled. It says gorgle.com instead of google.com. Uh, you don't wanna click that stuff. Uh, the content itself. Um, uh, again, creating that urgency. Avoid a negative consequence, gain something of value. Uh, does it have grammar or spelling errors? Not all of them will have grammar or spelling errors. Um, so in this, in this one, you can see this, this is pretty well written. There's not much grammar issues, um, but, sometimes, but obviously that's the quick giveaway. Um, is the center asking me to click a link or open up an attachment that seems odd or illogical? You know, why would this email ask me to click an attachment? And then, of course, how do I feel about this? Is this normal? Do I re did somebody really want to give me NFL Sunday ticket for free? Did somebody really want the copies of everyone's W-2s? Is, is this really necessary? Is this really normal? You know, your gut is uh, often good with this sort of thing, um, as long as you're skeptical. And is the email looking, asking me to look at a compromising or embarrassing picture of myself? Uh, well, that's a big one happening these days. I've gotten it, my colleagues have gotten these emails where it says, hey, you did something wrong, and oh my God, you're into some really weird stuff. You know, and it, sometimes it, it talks about personal things that you might be embarrassed about. You know, a lot of people have skeletons in their closet um, for, for personal items, things that aren't even uh, illegal or anything like that. And phishing uh, attacks often prey on, on your own insecurity. So um, they're going after that sort of thing too. Um, we talked about the attachments. Uh, the subject, you know, again, is it, is the, is it, uh, is it not relevant? Is it not mess message content? You know, this says my money got stolen, but uh, this is talking about passports. You know, things don't always make sense with some of these emails. And, was this sent at a normal time? Is your manager who is making the request for uh, finance transfer, are they sending this request to you at 3.30 in the morning and you know that they have a family and they're probably not up at 3.30 in the morning, maybe they're a very diligent worker, but they're not working in the middle of the night? You know, you should think about that sort of thing. Uh, ultimately, the people are really your greatest weakness, unfortunately. Uh, they can also be your greatest strength. Um, and so my belief, is that the best way to combat this stuff is to create a strong, um, a strong cultural awareness. You know, we want everybody to be skeptical. And the way uh, I recommend doing this is to do two things. One is uh, phishing testing, and the other is security awareness. So uh, phishing testing is basically, you know, sort of these, uh, you know, uh, it's all safe, but it's a, the ability to, to test people for their awareness to deal with these sorts of attacks. So what's a phishing test? So someone like me creates a, I call it a fake, fake email. So obviously phishing emails are fake and I create a fake one of those. Uh, I, I try and manipulate you the same way a uh, someone doing phishing might. You know, I send an email with corporate logos, creating urgency, et cetera, and I send that to your people. Uh, as it goes on, there's data collection. So, um, uh, I can see who opened the email, who like simply saw it. And basically an open is, is considered any time a piece of data is downloaded, like the text, which is not a failure, right? You know, if you just see that an email comes in, that's not failing a phishing test. 
but I can see that. I can see who clicked through, who opened the attachment, who replied, all that sort of stuff. And I'll, I'll get into a little more about data collection on another slide. Um, a landing page. So uh, when you fail the test, you know, if you if you fail the test, uh, you're directed to a landing page that tells you that. You know, it says, hey, you failed the test. And what I try and use it is as a teaching moment. Here's what you could have learned from this so that next time maybe you're a little bit more aware. You know, we don't want to shame people. We don't want to embarrass people. This is something that impacts every person in every organization. People fall for different things. People I catch on one phishing test sometimes never fall for it again. And people who I don't catch initially sometimes fail later. And so uh, we just want to create the culture of awareness so we can minimize those failures. I think the average click rate on a, on a phishing uh, attack is like 12%. Um, I want to get my clients down to as low as possible. It's never going to be 0%, but let's get it to 1% or 2% if we can. And then data analysis, you know, who's clicking? What's the dip, what's the ratio between who's, who's, who's seen the email and who fell for it? Um, what is it being blocked by the spam filter effectively? Is, um, uh, are, are the same people falling for the phishing attacks every time? Uh, are people more liable to open attachments as opposed to click links? What kind of information are people typically falling for? Are they falling for shopping stuff? Or are they falling for the more of the, uh, the type of attachment things or give me this information type thing. You know, we're trying to get that kind of information out so in order to better make the staff aware. So why do you do it? First is just to create awareness. Once it, this remarkable thing happens when I start doing phishing testing is as soon as I start testing an organization, they start asking me, did you send this phishing test? Did you, is this a phishing test, Ben? Did you do this? It happened when I started testing people here at DPS. And it happens pretty much with every client I work with who I do phishing tests on. Uh, once I start sending those emails and they get that they're subject to this stuff, all of a sudden people start looking out for it. They've all, the, the light bulb kind of wakes up once they actually see what goes on, which is exactly what we want. We want people to be skeptical. And, and that's what we're going for. Develop a skeptical staff who questions what emails mean and double checks things and, and avoids things before they become big problems. If my view is when we do a phishing test, if by doing this, we avoid one cybersecurity incident annually, we have easily paid for the entire program. And that's, I know that's easy for me to say, but consider every time you've had a, a ransomware attack or fraud occur or whatever, I mean, the damage is the productivity of your organization, the fraud, the embarrassment, the uh, insurance claims, all of that stuff is very, very costly. And it's worth making an investment up front to avoid those sorts of things. Obviously, I can't prove, you know, uh, which attacks we avoided because of this stuff, but I'm very confident based on the phishing test results that people fall for this stuff less the more we do it. As I said, the more we do it, the fewer clicks happen. This is seen in my own data, um, and I, I guess I haven't done a statistical survey, but people fall for it less the more I test them. Uh, the other piece I do as a part of this is security training. So. Um, obviously, we're so concerned about phishing, and usually when I do a phishing testing campaign, I'll do four phishing tests a year. You know, I'll just ping people every so often, not when they know it, but you know, I do it at times they might not expect it. Um, but I'll also do security training, so little modules to teach people things about cybersecurity. So the ones I do are web-based, on-demand, they're engaging and customized. So they're low commitment, easy to use, so on and so forth. And it's all on the web, so people can do it anytime, anywhere. Uh, it's fully automated, including automated reminders for end users. So what I'll typically do is I'll send out reminders every five days. Hey, you still need to take this thing. Um, you have these three modules left. There's five days to go, whatever we say. And, and we can change those messages or the reminders. But the idea is that if people don't comply, they're pinged until they comply. And we usually get people doing it. And it's good to ensure that employees understand about spam, phishing, spear phishing, malware, social engineering. Really a number of subjects. Uh, I have a lot, a large library of content that I work with, and based on the organization, we'll change it up. You know, uh, one, uh, you know, if I'm doing a quarterly security training for each one of uh, a series of clients, uh, I'm gonna do different things based on the industry they're in, the size of their organization, if they have remote users, if they have, a, you know, what, whatever they do, I want the training to speak to things that they're actually gonna see and feel and touch. And so it really is a back and forth. You know, I'm trying to create something tailored and specific to them rather than just boilerplate everything. 
So uh, before I conclude and get into the questions, I just want to show some demos of, of phishing testing and security awareness to get a sense of what this is rather than me just talk about it. Uh, so I sent this email to DPS uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, after, this was a, uh, a relief fund thing. So Hurricane Michael was a terrible tragedy, and um, all of a sudden I, I said, well, Google has a relief fund, and we're going to match stuff, so you really should donate, and has a link to click on. And um, I used a, a fake domain, relief-google.com, not a real domain, um, and it was just a very – Generic thing, I tried to create some urgency, all this matching stuff, and it's not personalized. And the reply to is Google Relief from Google Relief. It's just very sketchy. And um, in this case, I only caught one individual. Um, if you click through, uh, this is the landing page I created, and you'll notice in this case, the landing page is basically the email that I created, except I set up red flags. And uh, you can see the red flag here, if you hover over donate, the link doesn't take you to the site that the email content says it will. The URL here says something like um, uh, data input or something like that, where it's, uh, it has nothing to do with Google, and that's a big flag. Or if you hover over the donation, it gives you a different message. Basically, what I'll do is I'll take the parts of the email that seem sketchy, I'll flag them, and then if you fail, it tells you, hey, here are the things you could have uh, taken away from this to learn that this was not a legitimate email. So that maybe they're a little more aware next time. And again, this stuff really does work. Uh, you can see the results. This is a pretty uh, drab results. We didn't have many failures here. Uh, these guys uh, have, to, have had to deal with my phishing attacks a lot. So uh, they, they've gotten a lot better at, at not falling for this stuff. Um, it'll show you the statistics. Fish prone, 1.8%. That's pretty good. The industry average, I believe, is around 12 or 15%. A little statistics about this, the failures by day, so on and so forth. Uh, I'll typically run a phishing test over one day, um, and I'll spread those emails out over that day. So one person might get it at 9 a.m., another person might get it at 4.30 p.m., uh, something like that. But again, this is all tailor and changeable based, uh, based on what we want to do. Um, I get reports that I had a hard time fitting all this on the slide, and I didn't want to share everyone's information. But we can have each individual user. user you can see Ben Schwirler, me, I got the email. Um, it, uh, I didn't even open it, but if this was uh, clicked or applied, there would be a, uh, something indicating this. This is just raw data. The time was delivered. In this case, it was delivered to me at 12.43 p.m. On, on October 25th. The name of the employee, if I put their information in, you could add job title, et cetera. Um, I don't always do that. Uh, if I clicked on it, it'll tell me the IP, the location in, in which I failed, um, the browser I was using. So if I was using my phone or if I was using a Mac or a some hotel PC, it would know exactly what it was, and other statistics about this. And there's a lot of, uh, of stuff here. I didn't want to share it all because it's kind of private, but the point is, is that we can gather a lot of information about who did what and when. So uh, along with that, I want to show a little bit about security training that we do. So this is another training we did here. Um, after some of the recent uh, workplace violence news, which is really sad, we decided that we wanted to do uh, active shooter and workplace violence training. So I picked out some programs about how to deal with active shooters, et cetera, and I sent them out to the entire company. So everyone had to complete this training. It was uh, compulsory. You know, we take this stuff very seriously here, and I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody uh, did their part, you know, just in case the worst happened. So anyway, in this case, we chose two modules. I think these were both about 15 or 20 minutes long. I usually try with trainings to keep it in a reasonable time frame. You know, uh, you have 30 days to complete it, and it's maybe at most an hour. Usually, I keep it around 30 minutes of content. Uh, it shows when the activity of when people took it, the completion ratio, uh, who completed it, et cetera. It'll even tell me if it bounced back or whatever uh, Whatever happened. You know, this was a bad email address or whatever. Um, this is a different actual module, but the training is usually a video of some kind uh, with you know, a voice that talks to you about the subject and, you know, very basic stuff. This is meant for the end user. This is meant for the lay person. It's not meant for a security engineer. It's meant for the average person who has to respond to these issues as they occur. So it usually be a video, but it's also mixed up with interaction. So uh, this is just, again, back to the mobile device security. You can't just click the play button and just let it sit while you go have lunch or whatever. Uh, the video is going to require you to have interaction. They usually have quizzes. 
or interactable modules or drag this to there. You know, those sort of very simple things, things forcing people to engage with the content. And I think that's really important. How do you expect people to, to, to stick with it if they don't engage with it a little bit? In this case, you could click all these little puzzle pieces and you'd learn more about apps and the security run apps or Wi-Fi, so on and so forth. And until you do all of them, the, the thing doesn't proceed. Uh, when it's done, you get a similar report, who completed it and when. Obviously, that's a little more cut and dry. Either you did it or you didn't, and, and when. Uh, sometimes uh, people have issues with browsers and things like that, but we work with them on it. Uh, and people tend to be pretty satisfied with it. So uh, anyway, um, that's it for the prepared content. Um, we have a little more time, and I know this is a very important subject for a lot of people, so I wanted to leave a lot of time uh, for questions and answers because uh, this is a very broad subject. And there's probably a lot that, that people want to know. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, as Ben said, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them out in the question box and we'll answer them. Um, one question, just to get everything started, that we do get pretty frequently is, is phishing more of a concern for PCs or mobile devices? Phishing is a concern for devices that connect to the internet and, and in particular those that use email. So the answer to, to that question I would say is no. It's not particular to any specific device. Phishing doesn't care who you are, where you are, what you connect with, et cetera. It doesn't care if you're using, if you're checking your email on your little uh, Apple Watch, it doesn't care. If you can respond to it, if you can enter information or get hit with malware, uh, you're, you're a target. Now, whether it's effective or not is a totally different story, but um, you, it doesn't really matter what device you're using, especially if it's social engineering. You know, if they're looking for personal information, you know, it, the, the platform you give that information on doesn't really matter. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, another question came in, and what should I do if I think I've been a victim of phishing? It's a good one. That's a good question. So, um, obviously, the number one thing I would do if you feel like you've you've actually been attacked is you have to run through uh, the incident response program you have in your organization. So let's say you're the average client of, of DPS, you know, a, a small, medium business. Uh, obviously, I would say contact your support and say, I feel like this thing happened. Um, I need someone to look into this. Um, there's obviously a lot of steps that we need to take. One is to see if you've got like malware or something on your PC, you know, see if we have a technical thing to respond to. If it's fraud, you might need to communicate to people. Let's say you feel like you accidentally just gave out that W-2 to the wrong person. Well, now you have a management liability thing. You may need to talk to an attorney even, um, depending on the nature of, of the attack. Um, if you think your credentials have been phished, that is to say your login has been exploited. Oh, you know, I got linked to this thing and I entered my Google stuff, then it didn't work. And I looked at the URL and it wasn't Google, so I think my Google has been compromised, well, that's the time to change your password, to get, you get that stuff changed. And ultimately, be diligent, because it's really hard to know, after being the victim of a phishing attack, exactly how it's going to manifest itself and what consequences you're going to have. I would say those moments after that you, you feel like you've been phished are some of the most crucial moments, because you have to see what the actual fallout was. Um, I, you know, what I say is the best defense is is proactive and making sure you don't fall for it in the first place. But once you do, it's not the time to start trying to fix things on your own or try try to deal with it on your own. You have to communicate, you have to own up to it, and this is in order to avoid bigger problems. Um, and I would encourage everyone who's a manager here that when your employees do communicate with you that a cyber security incident happened or something like that, this cannot be the time to point fingers and, and, and give out blame. Um, you want people to be open and honest with cybersecurity incidents that happen within your office. If every time somebody has an incident, they worry that they're going to get fired or written up or something based on an honest mistake that um, that can happen to anybody, we create a we create the wrong effect. We now encourage people to not report the issues, and the damage from these issues becomes greater, and people stop taking the right approach. So the only culture we can have regarding this is a positive one, where people are encouraged to report and communicate and work together. And everybody recognizes that nobody is perfect, but that we put these tools in place so that we can, we can operate in the safest way possible. And it really is a team effort. I hope that answers the question. I mean, it's a very broad question to give, to give a response to. And so if, if the individual 
is uh, is um, if the individual is uh, in the middle of uh, in the midst of an attack, uh, it's really important to do that communication. All right, great, thanks, Ben. Hey, one more came in. How do fishers get my email address? How do fishers get your email address? Uh, very easily. Uh, uh, look, if you're sending an email on the public internet, um, it could go to any number of sites. They could get it. They could get it from somebody else they've reached. So let's say, for the sake of argument, uh, we're talking about Target, or we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, some of these other places that have been breached. They could get millions of email addresses just like that. You didn't do anything wrong. You you bought a thing online from Target or or whatever. That's one way. Another way is the public internet. You know, my email address, bschmerlertpsolutions.com, is meant to be public, right? I want people to email me, right? We do business. We want to have that interaction so people can see my email address. I would imagine many people on this call have a similar situation. You know, email addresses aren't private, essentially. The information you give in email may be private, but the address is generally not private. It's almost like saying, well, how does somebody who's who's calling me with a, a auto dialer on my phone, how do they get my phone number? They open up the phone book. I mean, it, this information is basically out there. So you just have to understand that this threat is always available and um, you just have to figure out how to deal with it. Okay, great. Looks like we do have one more question. Um, why can't the email service providers stop phishing messages? That is an excellent question. Um, there's a lot of reasons. One is um, volume. So when you have this many attacks, and again, phishing emails are a lot more seditious than, than typical spam. Spam filters are a lot more effective at sorting out junk than they are at sorting out uh, socially engineered attacks. If a message from somebody you trust that you've already received emails from uh, is asking for something, your spam filter is already conditioned to accept that email and to let it, allow it to get into your inbox, right? Uh, that's part of the social engineering aspect. What kind of that message can I send that is liable to get through and reach its, de uh, its destined audience um, uh, at, the, at the end of the day? And uh, all it's trying to do in a lot of ways is lower that spam score so it can get through. Um, the other thing is um, there's a, a concern about false positives, right? If email providers locked off every email that came in that was the tiniest bit suspicious, well, then we would have to be dealing with false positives all the time. So there's sort of a, that kind of error that we have to deal with. And inherently, uh, we, I think in order to be productive, we have to take the approach that, yeah, we might get a little bit of spam or phishing emails in our inbox. We just have to be careful even though we have a spam filter in place, it's going to block, you know, 90% of stuff that we might get that other 10%. Uh, that's very possible. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, I, I don't know in the future, you know, I'm not a, 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 a you know, high level network engineer or anything like that. I don't know if there's going to be a way in the future to, to dispel this a little bit more. I would say if phishing is like any other kind of cyber threat that we have out here, ransomware, or viruses, malware, whatever, um, this is just sort of a never-ending struggle, right? The cyber criminals create a, a scheme. They get good at it. The technology companies and end users get better at avoiding those things. And so the cyber criminals then evolve in their own way, which requires us to be diligent. And so in my view, again, the only way to really deal with this in an effective way, in a way that we mitigate our risk, bring our risk to as low as we can be, it's never going to be zero, but as low as we can be, is to have a constant awareness of what's going on. Learn what's new in our business. Learn what's new in the cybersecurity space. Figure out what kind of attacks we can exploit. Have strong company policies and strong culture where we respond to this stuff. Use the right technology to fight it and make those investments in the right things, not the wrong things. You know, sometimes people make investments in cyber in cybersecurity uh, in very expensive items that don't have the same effectiveness as, say, just a simple cybersecurity program. So, or our cybersecurity awareness program. So, I would say. It's stuff like that uh, that we have to do. It's too much to expect uh, technology companies to solve all of our problems as it pertains to cybersecurity. A lot of it is on us as end users to create strong behaviors so that we aren't, um, we aren't engaging the risk behaviors that cause these incidents. The analogy I've, I've used many times, especially if you've been on these calls with me before, is a lot of people get the flu shot, but it doesn't mean that you go around shaking hands with people who are sneezing and 
you know, blowing their nose and stuff like that, right? You got the flu shot, you probably have a pretty good chance of not getting the flu. You, you, you might still get the flu, but you have a better chance of not getting the flu. But it doesn't mean you engage in risky behavior. We put a, a, a technical control in place, this, this flu shot, that's designed to stop an incident from occurring, but it still might happen, and it means that we still act carefully and we exercise good risk control. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through, so I think that that wraps it up. Um, there was a concern about the social media red flags slide being cut off at the bottom, so I will go oh, ahead really? and email um, a link to that PDF with the follow-up email. There will also uh, be a recording um, that I'll email out as well as available on our website today or tomorrow. Well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. Everybody here at DP Solutions appreciates